All right, well, I get things set up. Turning your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter nine. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse number sixteen. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 16, the Bible reads, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So the title of my sermon this evening is going to be, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Amen. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Let me pray real quick. Dear Lord, uh, please fill me with your spirit. Help me to learn to be a better preacher and uh, help us to be edified by your word no matter who preaches it, if they're filled with the spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you just help us to learn from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So here we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul speaking. He says, you know, because, you know, really we're in the very first few words. It says, for, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. You know, some people glory about preaching the gospel. You know, but what it ultimately comes down to is that if you preach the gospel, you're just doing your reasonable service. Because he says, necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. I mean, if you think about that word woe, you look up the word woe, what does the word woe mean? You know, word woe simply means sorrow. You know, I, I, for a while there, I thought it meant literally, you know, like when he said, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel, he was meaning, you know, God's going to do woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. But I don't really think that's what Paul means. You know, woe just means sorrow in general. You know, but if you really think about it, you know, woe is something that occurs to you maybe by circumstance. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 20. Let's see what I think Paul is really talking about. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. You know, whether he was specifically talking about this or not, I think the point is still relevant. Revelation chapter 20, let's start in verse number 11. John the Apostle talks about the vision he sees. He says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. See, I, I, if any of you know me very well, I mean, I, I, I personally obsess over this vision of the Bible. I mean, this is something that I think about quite often. I use this verse and, and people talking about this passage as motivation to go out soul winning because, I mean, if there's ever a time where there's going to be woe unto you if you preach not the gospel, it's going to be right here. You know, because if you've ever sat and thought about it, I mean, every single person is going to be at this judgment. Every single human being that has ever lived, saved or unsaved, is going to be here. And we're, we as saved brethren, thank God, you know, our names will be found written in the book of life. We won't have to be cast into the lake of fire, thank God. But we're going to have to watch every neighbor, every friend, every family member, every person you've ever walked past, and, you know, billions more people that you've never known. You know, but somebody's friends, family, or loved one, we're going to have to watch each and every single one of them get judged for their lives if they're not saved and thrown into the lake of fire. Now, that is a day of woe. I mean, every person that you know that you tried to give the gospel to and they rejected it and they keep rejecting it, or every person you did know but you did not give the gospel to them. You know, we're going to say like Paul, woe is unto me that I didn't preach the gospel. And... You know, back over in 1 Corinthians 9, you don't have to turn there, but he says, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He says, 
For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. So one thing as a Christian, we can know that we're going to get rewarded for preaching the gospel. But he goes on to say, but if against my will, the dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. I mean, Paul, believe it or not, the great man of God that he was, there were times where he preached the gospel against his will. He didn't want to preach the gospel all the time. But guess what he still did? He still preached the gospel. Because a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto him. If you look up that word commit, it means to entrust. He was entrusted the gospel. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 quickly. Or I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5. I don't know why I let my page fall. It was right over there. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says... Uh, in verse 18, 2 Corinthians 5 says that all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given, us, given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You know, my friend Christian, brother in Christ, you have been entrusted with the word of reconciliation. You've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus did his part. He's not going to go preach the gospel to the whole world. He has given that to each and every one of us. And yet, you have Christians. People that believe like us even. Not even just Christians in general. Saved people in general. But people just like you and me who go to churches just like this or very similar. Who believe that there is a real hell. And that anybody that doesn't get saved is going to go there. And yet, they're too busy sitting on their butts, you know, watching some stupid game or playing some stupid game or just otherwise being comfortable because you know what? Going out soul winning is hard. It requires effort. You know, and maybe they, maybe people have legitimate reasons why they don't want to go soul winning. They can't go soul winning. You know, uh, you know, I can't really think of one, but you know, reasons where they would tell us and we'd think, you know what? I, I feel like I can't say anything to this person because you know, that's a pretty good reason. Like, I don't know what it's like to go through what they're going through. But, you know, it's not going to matter. I don't care what your excuse is. You're, we're all going to get to heaven one day. Or we're all going to stand before the great white throne and all of your excuses are going to be stupid. I don't care what your excuse is for not preaching the gospel. It's going to be stupid and you're going to be filled with so much woe and regret that it's going to be, you know, unbearable. That's why Jesus, that's why God's going to have to wipe away every tear. I mean, that, why, it follows it up right after Revelation 20 and 21. It talks about how God's going to wipe away every tear. Why do you think He's going to have to do that? Right after that, because there's going to be a lot of tears. I mean, that's going to be the most serious, and I mean, I think it's going to be the saddest day there ever was. I mean, second to maybe when the Lord died on the cross. I don't know. Uh, I mean, but for us, it's definitely going to be sad. And, you know... You know, it, I, you know, we've been to churches, right, where there's, there was, have been a lot of people going soul winning, right? We're a much smaller church. We don't have as many people that go soul winning. But even when we went to churches where they were big, they had a lot of people that went out soul winning, were fired up. You know, it felt good to be a part of a church, you know, that had so many people that were going soul winning. I mean, our church, a great percentage of our men go soul winning. I'm not knocking our church. But you know how it is when you're with a large group of people. It's like dozens of people out soul winning or even hundreds. I don't know. I, you know, I've been with dozens of people. You, you, know, you get fired up. You get motivated. You know, but the sad truth is, is that the laborers are still few. Let's turn to uh, Luke chapter 10. We'll close there. Real quick, Luke chapter 10. You know, woe is unto us if we preach not the gospel. And even if we did, you know, we, even if we got a church that had a thousand people, you know, and 200 soul winners, you know, it's still nothing to glory in. Because look what Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, verse 1. It says, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto him, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So Jesus just got done appointing seventy soul winners. Seventy. I don't think I've ever been, in, I don't know, I've never sat and counted. Maybe Brother Baker, I don't know if you can attest to how many people were at some of those bigger soul winning marathons, but 70 people. That's 35 teams of soul winners. I've never been a part of a soul winning movement that big. That'd be awesome. I'd be so fired up and motivated, and yet Jesus gets up and says, the laborers are few. You know, and the sad reality is, is you got people backing out of the fight, you know, who are loving this, current, you know, this, this present world, or who, you know, church is too much for them. It's too much to ask for you to go to church. It's too much to ask for you to go soul winning. And yet Jesus didn't think it was too much to ask to die for you on the cross. 
and yet you're, you're going to quit on soul winning, or you're going to find some excuse to not go soul winning, woe is unto you, my friend, because people are dying and going to hell because you didn't go soul winning. Amen. People are dying and going to hell, and you know, you don't care, you couldn't care less. You're saved just as much as I am, yet you're going to sit on your lazy butt and think, oh man, you know, it's too much to ask to go to church. It's too much to ask to go soul winning. I think I'm going to dial back. I think I'm going to go to another church because, well, I don't want to go to a church that expects too much of me because, you know, that's just uncomfortable. It's just more than I want to give of my life. And, you know, people want to cry, you know, whine and cry about, you know, how, oh, man, I feel like the preacher's preaching to me. If you feel like the preacher's preaching at you, then good. Do something about it and get up off your butt and get out there and do some work. Let's, have, let's, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity. I know I'm not the most eloquent speaker, but I pray, Lord, that you just uh, help us to get on fire for God and help these men to, uh, grow good at preaching and uh, help us, Lord, to just grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.